Now let's say you're able to find actual gravity waves. How will that help us? I think, it's, I think the most exciting way to think about it is that it's a new way to do astronomy. It's a new way of looking out at the universe. The measurement of gravitational waves per se isn't going to help me get better fuel efficiency in my car, but if you want to understand the way the, the universe works, um, having this new sort of window to look out at the universe would be very, very useful. Yeah. So we only <coughs> have the, essentially at the moment, most of our astronomy comes from just the electromagnetic spectrum itself. Uh, so gravity waves uh, are a completely new way of understanding the universe. And we don't really know exactly what we'll learn from it, but we'll know that we'll understand a lot more about gravity and, and how that shapes the universe around us by looking for these Now, uh, I signals. understand that the technology that you've had to develop to look for gravity waves is also useful in other areas as well. So even if you don't find any gravity waves, the technology is still very practical. What are some of the uses that it could be put to? Yeah, I mean, for all these, because we are, we, we're looking for the best quality materials, the lowest losses possible, uh, we've had to develop the technologies ourselves. So those technologies generate spin-offs uh, and some of them actually, just to measure the optical absorption of, uh, of the optics, a new method was developed for that uh, at Stanford University, actually. And uh, they are, um, this gives us a, a technique which allows us to very precisely measure how much light is essentially absorbed by the material itself in the optics. So that can be used for people who are manufacturing coatings, for instance, who are looking to see uh, for the best quality for applications in medical physics, we're looking at uh, optics for medical lasers, uh, how absorptive their materials are. So it's a method of doing that. And a number of commercial companies are now have now got those devices in their facilities for doing their optics development. Another thing that we've done a lot of work for developing is the high power lasers. Um, the, one of the reasons that the optical lo losses have to be so small is that for advanced LIGO there's going to be nearly a million watts of power circulating in that interferometer. And in order to get that much power we've had to develop a lot of new laser technologies. Um, <clears throat> there's now commercial applications of, of some of those lasers that are actually used in a very surprising way to put down um, parts of the, of the components of your iPhone um, are using, Sony uses the, the, the lasers that were helped to develop by the LIGO project as part of the standard metrology for measuring the commercial fabrication of, of consumer electronics devices. Now who supports this research? It doesn't sound cheap. Uh, is it the government? Is it private industry? Is it you know, foundations, who is uh, enabling this? Most of our money comes from the National Science Foundation, which yeah. is part of the U.S. government. But the, the international collaboration, the LIGO scientific collaboration, is funded by various, mainly government grants throughout the, uh, Europe, Asia. And you're here at Stanford from Scotland yeah. as, as part of this collaboration. I, I think it's called SU2P. Yeah. What does that stand for? So SU2P is a, a partnership between the Scottish University, Stanford University, Caltech, and various industrial partners. Uh, and it's really designed to link, first of all, the universities in California, so Stanford and Caltech, uh, with the, uh, the universities in, um, in Scotland, the major re research intensive universities and then establish those links with industry as well once you have the research going. So it's based mainly on photonics. Um, so my work comes from the optics part and the LIGO, the LIGO program uh, kind of allows the research of some very good quality optics. So that's how that falls into that. Is this sort of a top-down project where somebody is in charge and they say, we need this and we need that and we need that, this team do this, this team do that? Or are people just doing very basic research and seeing how it all comes together? Well, the, 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 the collaboration as a whole has, is split up into many different research groups. Uh, and uh, the, amongst all that, there's targeted research for each of the groups to work on. So that we're not all doing the same thing uh, all the time, but we're all looking at specific areas which are really important to the overall goals of, of, of LIGO. Yeah, if you'd asked us 10 years ago if it was if all of the technology for advanced LIGO was ready to go, we would have had to tell you no, that there were a number of groups who were trying to develop uh, technologies along guided paths from the, from the LIGO project. Of course, by now, we're actually installing hardware, so the designs are pretty well fixed. And we're starting to think about technology for 
future detectors. Now, when we look at the universe, uh, celestial events almost seem to take place in slow motion, like it might take a star many, many Earth years you know, to explode. So it's not like a sudden thing, like you have your detector, and all of a sudden there's a sudden surge and it's over. Um, I mean, do we expect all of space to be filled with gravitational waves coming from all directions if only the equipment was sensitive enough to measure it? It certainly is true. In fact, there's a project now called LISA, which is trying to put a gravitational wave detector in outer space. Um, the LIGO arms are four kilometers long. The initial design for LISA is to have arms that are five million kilometers long. And within a, with a detector like that, um, one of the fundamental noise sources of that is that there's so many pairs of stars that are orbiting around each other that all of those signals are hard to distinguish from one another. And so there's this background hum of gravitational waves in the universe that will be a noise floor for LISA if, if we could ever build that instrument. So these uh, <coughs> events which are happening happen all the time, but uh, and we're only limited by essentially the noise to see how far in the universe we can look at. One interesting thing is that compared to the electromagnetic uh, uh, waves that we observe the universe for just now, we're really capped off at the cosmic microwave background, so we can't see any further uh, uh, back in time because light ta line takes time to travel. That's really, uh, we're capped at that. But gravitational waves, we have the possibility if we can get our detector sensitive enough to actually measure uh, events that happened right at the Big Bang itself. So uh, one of the reasons why people are interested in doing science is because of curiosity. What's the nature of the universe and what's man's place in the universe? So do you feel that this kind of research could shed light on that, give us a better idea of uh, who we are and, and what our place is here? You know, one of the things that I think is really cool about astronomy is that if you look at the very early universe, you know, the things that existed in the very early universe were hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and a few other trace elements. But if you look at the matter on the Earth now, there's all kinds of interesting elements. So if there's any iron on the Earth, that iron was probably formed in the inside of a sun and through the fusion processes that, that go on in that sun. And then that star blew up, probably, and that caused those kinds of supernovas or something that, that LIGO can actually look at when the when that, when that star finally collapses and, and then moments later explodes, the, the core of that sun, which is, which is burning out and, and now exploding, um, has a lot of mass in it. And that mass is, is, is undergoing huge accelerations. But you can't see it now with the electromagnetic universe, right? Because the outside of that star is still burning. And so the, the exciting stuff in the middle is, is hidden. But if you have a way of watching the mass evolve, like, like LIGO, then you can watch the centers of these, of these supernovas and get a better feel for how they actually work. And that's the, the really great thing about uh, the type of research which LIGO can do. These gravitational waves are the, what's happened at the, right at the core of these events that we'd never be able to see normally through electromagnetic waves. Uh, and that's a great thing. We've got this fundamental research, which has lots of real-world applications to the technologies which are now, developed. I'd love to ask more questions, but I've gotten the signal, so we are going to have to wrap oh, the show, excellent. unfortunately, <laughs> because I have a lot more things I'd like to yeah. know about. I'd like to thank my two distinguished guests, Ricardo Basiri and Brian Lance. Thank you for watching. Be sure to visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you next time. Okay. Yeah. Now the lights should be off. Good job. <laughs>